Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Morality is a fascinating subject, especially in the era of intelligent AI machines. We make moral choices every day, often without realizing it. We have visceral responses to things that we can't explain easily. How should we think about the morality of machines that are making more and more decisions for us and shaping society? Joining me today is Peter Railton, professor of philosophy at the University of Michigan, where he teaches introductory courses on morality and ethics. Peter has analyzed the well-known trolley problem and come up with new insights that have important implications for how we think about moral judgment in AI machines. Peter, welcome to Brave New World. Delighted to have you on the show. Well, it's wonderful to be here and have a chance to share ideas with you. So, Peter, before we get started, you know, maybe we can kick things off by telling us a little bit about yourself, you know, just something personal to share with people who tune in from all over the world. Well, one thing that occurred to me that people might not know about a philosopher at any rate is that uh, I spent a year working in an automobile factory right after college, and it was a transformative experience for me in many ways partly because of what I learned about human dynamics, that's the sort of intellectual side, but also because I learned that the people who work in auto factories are like people everywhere, academics, they're just as curious, capable, intelligent. And my experience was that this seemed like a tremendous waste, that they had so many skills and capacities uh, that were not being used and work was such a big part of their lives. And so uh, that experience made me look at the world a bit differently and not be so motivated to think that the people around me or the people in society general were psychologically or otherwise less competent. And that has influenced a lot my thinking in uh, moral philosophy, that I've been looking for ways to understand intuitive competency and uh, see if we can validate it in some way, look for evidence for that. So how did you end up working in an automobile factory and what did that have to do with your sort of subsequent trajectory towards moral philosophy? Well, it really was part of my trajectory toward moral philosophy. As an undergraduate, I'd studied philosophy and uh, particularly focused on issues in philosophy of language. But it was also in the 60s, a very political time. I'd been politically active. I recognized that I'd spent my entire life in sheltered academic settings. And I thought, well, it's about time for me to venture out into the world and put some of my thinking to a challenge. So I thought, well, uh, to do that, I'm going to have to change my climate, my environment, and uh, change it in a way that I can't bring with me a lot of the supports that I would have, a lot of the cultural capital that I would take advantage of if I moved into a different academic environment. And so I thought it'd be important to work in a situation where I was thrown much more on the... Uh, generosity and beneficence of others, which I found. Right. So you teach an introductory course on philosophy and also on morality and ethics. What are you seeing out there? I mean, you know, one of the things I really want to talk to you about is what this all means in the age of AI and, and machines, whether machines can be moral and you know whether they can learn morality and all those really interesting questions that I've actually discussed with some people on the show. You know, I, I touched on this with, with Brian Christian in a previous part. But before we get there, Let's sort of set the stage in terms of so what's known and not known about intuitive moral judgment. What does moral judgment even mean? Just, just let, let's just define this. Yeah, well, that's a huge question. And the very short answer is that not enough is known. And uh, what is known is bits and pieces here and there. And to have any sort of synthetic view, you have to try to put these bits and pieces together. One feature of moral judgment is that there really are two sorts of things that we can think of as as moral judgments. One would be how someone responds, which might be an affective response. It might be a behavioral response that involves an assessment of the situation in some sense. Uh, Emotions, for example, are thought of as having an evaluative or an appraisal element. So it might be that the person is appraising the situation a certain way emotionally Then there's also judgment is in the sense of what would someone pronounce? What would they say about the situation? And those can be quite different. We can fail to know what our intuitive responses are in the first sense, the affective sense. Uh, The cognitive sense can reflect 
a lot of a posteriori, sorry, ad hoc reasoning. And the general sense that I've gotten over time is that it's very important to see what information might be contained in those first affective responses and uh, to figure out uh, whether there's some competency there. So one way of asking the question about moral judgment or moral intuition would be like asking a question about intuition in any area, Uh, intuition of skilled individuals, intuition of expert players of games or chess, intuitions of people who work in various uh, complex settings. Uh, A lot of what we think is intuitive. And what would it be that would allow such uh, information, uh, such intuition to be informative and to be such that it's actually based upon something that looks like learning and could constitute a kind of knowledge. So one quick answer would be, we're beginning to get from artificial intelligence, especially with deep learning and neural networks, we're beginning to get a picture of what such intuitive knowledge might be like and how it might be acquired and how it might be different from declarative knowledge in the usual sense but how it could contain a fantastic amount of information and be very effective in guiding intelligent behavior. And similarly in neuroscience, we're getting evidence of that kind of competency. So one question is what kind of judgment do you have in mind? The felt judgment or the pronounced judgment? And a second question would be, what was that felt response due to? What might it represent in terms of capacity learning intelligence. And so a lot of what I've focused on is trying to understand how that could be the case. And what's been delightful for me in the recent developments in uh, cognitive science and neuroscience is how very much uh, evidence has been accumulating about the power of such intuitive methods. So that's the, that's the rough picture, but I wanted to, to say something more, which is we should say a little bit of something about what we think an intuition is in just a descriptive sense. So I'd be glad to talk about that as well. Yeah, yeah. I, in fact, I was going to ask you this because you were talking about what we feel and what we say. Uh, if, if I were to sort of, at, at the risk of oversimplification, there's this there's some sort of, there's something we feel and then there's something we express. And those two things are not always consistent. But yeah, go ahead. So what is intuition? So uh, descriptively, we might think that uh, intuition is uh, a kind of response, an evaluative, uh, usually a valenced response, uh, a response that uh, conveys, for example, some kind of information about how to act or what to feel in a given situation. It's a response that is relatively undeliberative. It occurs relatively effortlessly, often very quickly. Uh, It's a response that, when it occurs, seems to carry with it some authority, so that it will often feel like a mistake to act against one's intuitions, even if, through various forms of reasoning, one has convinced oneself that they're problematic, uh, it's very hard to shake them. So even the convinced utilitarian may find it very hard to shake counter-utilitarian intuitions, and that that doesn't go away with age, and the rationales that are developed don't seem to Uh, transform the the capacity for this intuitive judgment. And similarly, uh, intuition has the feature that it is tends to be opaque. Even when we reflect upon it, do we know where it comes from? Can we understand it? Can we reconstruct it by some kind of process? And so you could think that intuitions in the descriptive sense combine these various qualities. They're relatively effortless. They're relatively opaque. They nonetheless have some kind of, seem to convey some kind of authority. They often have a positive or a negative valence with regard to action or thought. And the final feature is that we can act intuitively. You can have a whole string of complicated actions. I don't know, you're a jazz musician improvising, which is intuitive. And that that string can be an extremely uh, elaborate response to the environment, the situation, the musical context. So intuition seems to be capable of quite complex behavioral and thought guidance. Right. So is this this similar to what uh, Herbert Simon would call compiled knowledge and what Kahneman would call fast thinking, but with this additional normative authority overlaid on it? Is that a reasonable way to describe it? 
Well, I think it's something that they were, insofar as I understand uh, these individuals, that they're both uh, trying to capture. I would disagree with the way in which uh, Hahnemann has often characterized this kind of intuitive judgment. Uh, he says in various places that it's ignorant of logic and statistics, that it is effective in a way that suggests that it doesn't embody any kind of rationality. I don't think he really would uphold those theses if they were put that baldly. Uh, and so I would want to put the emphasis on the idea that a great deal of our rationality and our statistical capacity, our reasoning capacity, is intuitive. When we're passing from one premise to another, even in an explicit inference, if we were to say that that passage is mediated by reasoning, we'd immediately launch a regress. So there must be some intuitive capacity to grasp the content of a premise, to carry from that to the next premise, and to do so in a way that has force that we take to convey some kind of logical force so that the conclusion has credibility. But if we rely upon an iteration of rules to explain that, uh, we get a regress. So what do you mean by we get a regress? Regress to what? So th there's a, a wonderful example of uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, Achilles and the Tortoise. And he's trying to uh, discuss the question of uh, how modus ponens works. And he has a dialogue between a tortoise and Achilles. And um, Achilles basically is saying, well, modus ponens works like this. You have a premise, if P, then Q, another premise, P, and from that you infer Q. And the tortoise says, but didn't you leave something out? Don't you also need a rule? that if P, then Q, and P, then Q. Shouldn't that be one of your premises? Achilles says, yeah, yeah, of course, let's put that in the premises. And then the tortoise says, no, nah, no, nah, wait a second. <laughs> we need another rule, which says, if, if P, then Q, and P, then Q, and if P, then Q, and P, then Q. Yeah, sure, go ahead and do that, Achilles says. And what becomes clear is that it must be something mediating the inference that isn't just a rule that functions as a premise in the inference. So there have to be inferential processes that are immediate or intuitive and uh, that don't rely upon the iteration of uh, deliberation or rules. So, you know, I want to segue into the work you've done on the trolley problem, okay. which has been very widely used by lots of people to study morality. And I've read your work on it where you have sort of six variants of the the problem, and you've done all these experiments where you describe these problems to people and elicit their response, like what, what's, what's the right thing to do here? So walk us through the trolley problem, because I think uh, of, of anyone I know, you've described it more clearly than anyone else, and, and also some of the implications of the results, right? You, you've not only studied what people say, but then you've sort of followed up with them and, and done some analysis of, you know, what people thought of these responses or what people thought about people who had these responses, right? So let's unpack that whole arena. I, th I think people will find it interesting because, you know, that problem is something that's very commonly used by people in a casual way to illustrate some of the problems with programming morality into machines. So I, I think it'll serve as a good springboard for going there. But before we do that, let's just like take some time and you can describe those six variants and you know what the results are and the implications of, of those results. Well, the first thing to me to say is that among philosophers, I'm not a high-level trolleyologist. There are people who've devoted much more thought and attention to these questions. I love that trolleyologist. Yeah. So. And elaborated many, many more <laughs> scenarios. I might mention Francis Cam, who's the, in, in some ways been the inspiration of a tremendous amount of this work. And um, I'm also not a psychologist. So the experiments that I run are informal experiments. I teach large introductory ethics classes, among others. And I give students a device they can hold in their hands. Now I do it through Zoom, of course. Uh, which enables them to confidentially respond. And then I pose questions to them, including trolley problems. And what this enables me to do is to get their responses quickly and then to start asking further questions to explore why it is they might think this or what things might be collateral to it or related to it. 
in a way that eventually convinced me. I was originally a skeptic. I thought, well, these trolley problems are kind of contrived. Uh, they're artificial, hypothetical. I was really doubtful that they had the centrality that many people assigned to them. But then I came to think, actually, this is a, a way of probing people's moral competency that can be much richer. So I'll give you some examples of how that might work. We all know the original trolley cases. There is a case where a runaway trolley is going down a track. Further down the track are five workers, don't see the trolley coming, won't be able to get out of the way in time. If the trolley continues down the main track, it will strike and kill them. You are, by chance, standing next to a switch, which could divert the trolley to a side track, where only one worker is standing. And so if you were to throw the switch, the trolley would go down the side track and strike only one worker, should you throw the switch. And very reliably, uh, undergraduates will say by a fairly, very hefty majority, 70, 80% typically, uh, you should throw the switch. Then you ask what is sometimes said to be an equivalent question, which is suppose the situation is as before, but you don't have any switch. In fact, you're standing on a footbridge over the trolley track. You're just a scrawny young person. Your weight would not be sufficient to stop a trolley. However, you happen to be standing next to a very large gentleman whose weight would be sufficient. And if you were to push this gentleman off the footbridge at just the right moment, the trolley would strike him and stop and would save the five workers. Should you push the large gentleman off the footbridge? And now only 30% or so will say yes. And this is thought to show something quite important. People can say, well, aren't the outcomes the same? You save five at sacrifice of one. And the one that gets sacrificed is an innocent, in no way responsible for the threat to the five. Uh, and in both cases, you're taking some kind of action. You're intervening into the situation. So why should it matter whether you lay hands on this person and push them off a footbridge or pull a lever and more antiseptically have that person struck on the sidetrack? And various principles have been elaborated to try to explain this difference. And the trouble was that the most plausible initial principle, which was a something like a version of a means end principle that in the case of sidetrack, the individual on the sidetrack is not being used as a means to save the five. In fact, if that individual were off the track to step off the track, you'd be delighted. So it's not any part of your intention to kill that individual. Uh, it's just something you can foresee as an unfortunate effect, a side effect as sometimes it's put. In the footbridge case, on the other hand, you're actually using this individual as a means. If the individual uh, were to disappear, your means would be frustrated. If you were to miss the track with the individual, your means would be frustrated. And so you must, in some sense, intend that person to be hit by the trolley. And the thought is that that makes the moral difference between the two. And so this leads to the case of loop. Now, a loop is just like the original switch case. Trolley's coming down the track, five down the track, one on a sidetrack. However, the one on the sidetrack is a large individual, and the track the sidetrack actually loops so that it departs from the main track, goes up through a loop, and comes back to the main track. So if you were to throw the switch, the trolley would go down the sidetrack, hit the large individual, and stop, and that would save the five. But if the large individual were not there, the trolley would just go around the sidetrack, back to the main track, and strike the five. So now it looks as if this man is indeed something that you're, is part of your intention, that this man be struck by the trolley. and if you ask students, well, what about that? Should you throw the switch in the loop case? And now we're back up to 60, 70% acceptance. And so that makes it seem as if the principle couldn't possibly be, at least the intuitive principle couldn't possibly be the one that I first articulated because now you are using the man on the sidetrack as a means. And so a lot of psychologists became interested in this as well as philosophers. And there were various hypotheses elaborated. One was that the distinction between these cases is really a matter of personal versus impersonal. In the footbridge case, you actually lay hands on the person, exert muscular force to throw the person to that person's death. In the sidetrack cases, you just throw a lever and the person is killed indeed, but uh, you don't have to have this intense personal involvement with the individual. And so it's actually this psychological difference between the personal and the impersonal, which people argued at the time, uh, Josh Green and others, is not really morally significant. And so therefore they argued that we should have more confidence 
in the utilitarian position that you should minimize harm and pay less attention to the seeming violation of the minimizing harm principle that comes about in the case of Footbridge. So that was early on the way things looked. It looked as if at first the trolley problem was a way of arguing against utilitarianism and that the evidence that was assembled suggested that uh, it couldn't be used in that way. And indeed, Green and others started doing fMRI studies, and they found that the response in the case of Footbridge seemed to be largely uh, a change in affective state uh, with lower levels of cognition, again, suggesting something that didn't seem morally significant. So a couple of things. So, so in other words, different parts of the brain lit up when people were looking at Footbridge versus switch or loop? Yeah, you know, it's very hard to interpret these fMRI studies, but uh, the idea was that some areas involved with emotion showed an increase in activity in footbridge as compared with switch. Yeah. And some areas associated with cognition showed a decrease in activity uh, compared to switch. So the thought was, when we think of it cognitively, we are something like loss minimizers, and that favors the utilitarian interpretation. It's only when we have this situation that causes emotional churn, or as people sometimes put it, sends off an emotional alarm bell, that we are frustrated or blocked or overwhelmed, and therefore the cognition and the reasoning that would go behind it for minimizing harm uh, doesn't go through. Could, could it also be like that there's a risk involved? You know, I mean, if I'm scrawny and I'm pushing a very large mm-hmm. gentleman, I might end up on the track myself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, maybe I'm just processing the possibility of that (laughs) risk and and it's causing my brain to light up and, you know, emotional centers or whatever you want to call them, that that it's it's causing some sort of distress just to think about pushing someone off the bridge because I might end up off the bridge. Well, that's a good point. And a lot of these examples are set up so that they don't involve the notion of risk at all. It's, It's determinate what will happen. You know for sure what will happen. And in any real situation, there would be risk. And in fact, some people have set up uh, situations in which individuals actually think they are throwing a switch to divert a a train to save workers. And in that situation, a lot of people just froze up and didn't take action, even though they might previously have said, you should throw the switch. In in actual fact, uh, they found it impossible to do that. So to go back to your point, Here's another example, and this is what people do in these trolleyology discussions, and I hope your audience has got some patience for this. They elaborate, okay, well, here's another case. So what do you think of this? This is a case that I call WAVE. And in WAVE, there's no risk to you at all. The trolley's charging down the track. There are five workers down the track. There's also one worker standing beside the track. You don't have a switch. You don't have a large gentleman to throw. You're off to the side. But as it happens, the workers are looking in your direction. Now, if, as you see the trolley approaching, which they don't, you wave them to the side, the five will step off the track and be saved, but the one who was beside the track will step onto the track and be hit. Okay, is that clear enough? Yeah. Yeah, okay, call that wave. Uh, Should you wave? 70, 80% say yes, you should wave. Here's a second. I'm going to call this beckon. Trolley's coming down the track as before. Five workers down the track. There is a man standing on the other side of the track who can't see the trolley coming because of a little shed. And he's looking in your direction, however. Now, if you were at just the right moment to beckon enthusiastically toward that individual, come over here. He would step on the track, be hit by the trolley, and stop it. So now you're not laying hands on the individual. You're not exerting direct muscular force. There's no risk of your falling on the track. All you're doing is a hand gesture. And in the case of wave, a hand gesture seemed to be okay, seemed to be something we, most people would find it acceptable to do. What about beckon? Well, now beckon, 30% say you should do it. 70% say no. So moving away from the footbridge switch case, we can find cases that subtract some of these seemingly important features and still get the same kind of asymmetry. And when I discovered this with my students, I began to think, well, what could possibly be going on? And does this show that the intuitions are really just 
dependent upon very arbitrary features of the situation. And so I began to ask them questions like, suppose you were in your room one day and your roommate showed up all excited and said, you know what just happened? I was standing next to the trolley tracks and this trolley was coming down. It was out of control. It was going to strike five workers. There was this switch. I threw the switch and it went on a side track and killed a person. I don't know how to feel about this. I don't know what to do. Um, question. If you heard that from your roommate, would you trust your roommate the same, more, or less? And the overwhelming response is the same. Very few say more, very few say less. Well, what about footbridge? Suppose your roommate came home and he said, this terrible thing happened to me. I was on the footbridge and there was this large guy. And the only thing I could do to stop the trolley was to push him off the footbridge. Um, and I did it. I don't know what to think. Uh, what would you say about your roommate? Would you trust him more, the same, or less? Overwhelmingly, less. No one, almost no one says more. So nearly 90% say less, often. And so that suggests that maybe part of what's driving this difference in verdict is an evaluation of the question, what kind of person would do this action? And then when you give them beckon and wave, what if your friend came home, your roommate came home and said, I waved to the trolleys or came home and said beckoned. If your friend or roommate waved, it's very similar to switch. People would trust the individual just the same. If the individual beckoned, big shift toward distrust of the individual. Very few would trust the individual more. What about loop? Give the people the example of loop. Would you trust the individual the same more or less? And it's got the same profile as switch and wave. So. It occurred to me that what people are actually doing when making these intuitive judgments is they are modeling the agent in the situation using a kind of competency and making an assessment that is mediated by a judgment, what kind of person would do this? What motivations would lead a person to do this? And then psychologists started looking at the population who give the push verdict as opposed to the ones who refuse to push in footbridge. And they turned out, in many of these cases, not to be more altruistic, not to be more utilitarian, not to be more morally principled, but to score higher in psychopathology indices, to show uh, less regard for rules. Uh, and so it seemed like my students were on to something. People who would do that might very well be less trustworthy. And they modeled that right away when they were given the trolley situation. So then you can elaborate some more situations, exploiting this idea. and you find that a lot of the asymmetries in moral judgments are actually mediated by this kind of indirect judgment. What kind of a person in those circumstances would perform this action? So what's the takeaway from this for ordinary people like myself? What should we take away? Is, is the takeaway that if someone appears empathic, that we would trust them more than if they just seemed consequentialist and, and just did a hard core cost-benefit analysis? Is that the takeaway or is that too simplistic? Well, part of what's interesting is even people who, you know, some 25, 30% of people will say you should push in, in footbridge, but nothing like that say they would trust the individual more if the individual performed the action. So they're not just inferring from the rightness of the action to the trustworthiness of the individual. People who think it's the right action to perform still would trust the individual less if the individual performed it. And that's maybe because there are some actions which in the context would be right in their view, but only a bastard would perform it. And we're all familiar with that possibility in the real world. So that it's part of their moral competency to separate the question, uh, what would be an optimal action from regard to, with regard to harm or something like that from the question, what would it take to be the kind of person who would perform this action? So one thing you might conclude is that the traditional dichotomy, which has always been in play, that somehow the push response is utilitarian and the switch response is uh, either utilitarian or not, and the deontic response is don't push, uh, it could be that the don't push response is not to do with deontology at all. And that explains why people have not been able to articulate good deontological principles, because the principle doesn't work for cases like Beckon, and the principle doesn't work for cases like Luke. So there isn't any deontological, good deontological explanation that's widely accepted. 
That may be because it's not about deontology versus utilitarianism. It's about the way people model the situation in moral judgment, in intuitive moral judgment. And that may be much more complex than we thought it was. And this feeds into a whole body of literature that suggests that our intuitive thought processes are based upon complex modeling of the world, their elaborated competencies, and we can use these models to run simulations and ask questions like, what kind of person would do this? So uh, I thought, well, maybe the trolley problem does tell us something about people's underlying moral competencies. It seems to fit with a lot of the psychological evidence. And if that's right, then we should be thinking of moral judgment in a different way. It's not deontology versus utilitarianism in the sense that we should identify the principle that fits all the cases. We should find what bit of knowledge would be such as to yield these kinds of judgments. Fascinating. And thanks for that summary. I hadn't thought about morality in those terms, as in what kind of person would do that, although it seems obvious in retrospect, as many things do. So let's push on this a little further, uh, your statement of like that we need to think about morality in a new way. One of the questions I had when I was thinking about our conversation was you know, whether this is something innate or it's learned. And I guess you take the position that it doesn't need to be, maybe I'm misstating this and you can correct me, that it doesn't need to be innate, that this stuff is learned, that morality is learned by observation, by imitation. Am I summarizing your position more or less correctly? Well, you've got the basic idea, which is that uh, we don't have to think of these as, as innate capacities. You might think on analogy with, let's say, theory of mind cognition, capacity we have to uh, understand what mental states others are in, how those would predict to their behavior, and to use that information in our conversation, in our dealings with people. Most of that information is intuitive. Most of the competency that's involved is intuitive. How would we ever explain exactly what it was that led us to think that this act and this situation would have these consequences, mediated by an understanding of what mental states others are in? But we do it, and we would have to be able to do it reasonably well to be the kind of social creatures we are. So uh, we should expect people like us, hypersocial individuals, who evolved and owed much of their evolutionary success to their ability to cooperate, to cooperate even with strangers, to engage in collaborative activities, to develop something like shared culture, to pass it on. Creatures who were like that and who could owe their success, if you wish to call it that, evolutionary success to that, would need to have this capacity to understand other people's minds and use that information in these ways to communicate, to act, to form expectations, to collaborate, and so on. So uh, that's sometimes spoken of as social learning, but it's not just learning in the sense that someone is teaching you something. Um, infants are not taken aside and explained. When you see these kinds of particular features of people's facial expressions, that means they're feeling a, a form of regret tinged with guilt. They, they don't, but they will eventually learn this. And so somehow they develop these complex models of others, can use them effectively. People apparently are fairly good at predicting other people's emotional responses. And uh, it, that depends on innate capacities, certainly. Uh, capacities for perception and modeling, uh, capacities for counterfactual thought, uh, simulation. Um, but we don't have to think that there's a body of knowledge that they're given uh, innately uh, that explains this competency. And indeed, if you look at infant learning, infant development, you'll see that theory of mind develops right alongside causal competency, uh, that the two proceed together. And if you look at moral development, it also proceeds along similar timescales and similar steps, suggesting that there is a kind of shared capacity to learn, uh, but that's at work in these various tasks, theory of mind, causal reasoning, moral reasoning. It would make sense because you could think of moral reasoning as essentially involving theory of mind and causation. Right. Let's come back to something that you mentioned earlier, and this gets us into artificial intelligence and machines. You talked about deep learning and all of this progress that we're making in perception, like in vision, language, 
speech. We have some idea about what morality means intuitively, but it's hard to come up with theorems around this, right? Mm -hmm. One of the challenging questions in AI is, can machines learn morality on their own, just like humans do? Or does it need to be programmed by design? How do you think about this? Well, one challenge that we would face if we tried to program it is that we really wouldn't know how because we don't know a set of underlying principles that govern all situations that would enable us to derive uh, conclusions that that strike us as morally appropriate. And that's sort of what the trolley problem suggests, that we, we don't know how to specify what the principles are. And maybe that's because it's not principle-based. Maybe it's a kind of competency basis. And that's similar with uh, perhaps language learning as well, that Uh, Infants from a very, very early age uh, start learning statistical regularities in the sounds around them, extracting from that uh, regularities and expectations. They can form these eventually into ideas of anomalous and non-anomalous speech and so on. And so if we think about it as a learning problem, you could say, well, what would infants have to do to be able to learn moral evaluation? And uh, I'll give you a, a comparison. Go back to this question of trust. Infants have to learn which individuals to trust. They have to learn which individuals are dangerous to them, which individuals are dangerous to others, which individuals are reliable in what they say or what they do. And evidence suggests that infants actually get pretty good at detecting adults who are more or less reliable. Does the adults do what they say? Uh, if the adult says something's going to happen, does that thing happen? Uh, does the adult seem to be competent with language? Infants, are, infants pay attention to this. And they learn preferentially from the more competent individuals who may or may not be their parents, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and so infants need to be able to represent the trustworthiness of individuals in their environment, not just with regard to their own interests, because these are often third-party transactions that they're, they're dealing with. They need to learn it as a kind of what you could think of as a non-egocentric representation of trustworthiness in their environment. After all, the person who's untrustworthy because they play favorites might favor you today, but won't favor you tomorrow, and you need to know this about the individual. So infants need a map of their social situation in terms of trustworthiness and epistemic authority of individuals. And with that, they can learn more effectively. Well, infants also pay attention to whether individuals are helpful or not helpful, uh, to whether individuals hinder others' plans or enable them to carry out others' plans. They're attentive to positive sum versus negative sum interactions. And so from experience, they can acquire information about not only which individuals behave in ways that result in negative sum interactions and conflict, but also learn uh, what kinds of behaviors result in positive versus negative outcomes for the both of the individuals involved. And so that part of morality, that can be understood as a non-egocentric representation of the environment around them, of the actions and the actors and situations around them. And uh, similarly for the sort of social contract part of morality, do people keep their promises? Do they not keep their promises? Do they manifest respect for others or not? What does this mean for their behavior? And what Turiel and other developmental psychologists have found is that even at age four, infants will uh, refuse to perform harmful actions at the command of an authority and therefore show a distinction between what they take to be uh, an acceptable action and what the conventional authorities are telling them. How would they understand this difference? Well, because they know which actions are going to be harmful are going to have a negative effect on the individuals involved, and they don't trust the authority. So how did they learn to do that? The authority didn't tell them, don't trust me. Parents don't say, don't trust that. But infants can learn this kind of thing. If they can learn it, they learn it from experience. We're just machines. No principal reason why machines couldn't learn in the same way. Wow, super interesting, this distinction between morality based on principles versus morality based on learning competency. Hadn't thought about it that way. I'm learning something new about morality, as I'm sure the listeners are. 
So this makes me ask a somewhat tangential question, which is, are we, as a species, if we can think of morality at the individual, society, communities, are we kinder and gentler as a species than we were 50, 100, 200 years ago? I mean, I think of our history, which has been quite brutal. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a guest, Sam Moyne, who's an intellectual historian, talk about how war has become more humane. Or at least that was the question, right? Has war become more humane? And, and this question came up even in that conversation. Have we become more humane as a species, we started with Tolstoy and I you know the late 1800s. And are we better people than we were 200 years ago? Are we? How do you think about this? Has morality evolved and made us better? Well, there are certainly a, a, a number of ways in which it, it has evolved, and I think uh, made us into fairer individuals, uh, individuals who are not only more empathic, but better capable of respecting the rights of others, refusing to accept certain kinds of uh, prejudice against others. For example, when I was young, the acceptability of uh, gay relationships, gay marriages was extremely low. Between then and now, it has become the preponderant view of this, that this is quite acceptable. Even among religious individuals, there's been a dramatic increase. Even among right-wing individuals, there's been an increase. So what, what would explain this? You know, is this just people change their minds about homosexuality? Well, of course, they had to do that. But what might have driven it? And certainly one thought would be that in the 90s, individuals who were gay courageously self-identified as gay, and people learned that, uh, heterosexual people learned, that their neighbor, their child, their beloved uncle, their coworker was gay. And they knew already independently whether this was a good or a bad person, whether they were reliable, whether they were a decent, friendly person or not. And so suddenly they had evidence that the theory, the dominant theory, didn't allow them to acquire because the dominant theory said, well, homosexual is depravity. This was evidence from their own experience. And did it seem appropriate for such people who they knew intimately uh, to be denied such basic things as the capacity to form relationships and marry and be with the people they love? Well, that didn't seem plausible anymore. And so uh, the development of acceptance of gay marriage, for example, could be thought of as a kind of a moral progress, but it was driven experientially. Similarly, we've seen progress with regard to gender, uh, with regard to the idea of, of race. Uh, we've seen progress, I would point to animals as an interesting case, because you might think, well, animals, they're not in a position to uh, uh, reciprocate with us very much. And yet, uh, human concern about humane treatment of animals has become vastly more widespread. Uh, so it does seem as if there can be moral changes that indicate a a wider expansion of the sphere of uh, moral concern and of equality in the sphere of moral concern, equal standing or standing proportionate to capacity. This is something that, among others, Peter Singer has emphasized. And if that's right, then that's a picture of how experiential learning mechanisms can play a role in the development of this kind of moral inclusivity. What about war? Well, War is probably not the best place to look for morality, but even in war, we now recognize that there are rules of war, uh, that there are forms of atrocity that are war crimes. Uh, they can be prosecuted. We recognize that prisoners uh, should not be just tortured and killed, uh, but we accept extremely high casualties, um, and uh, we have the mechanical capacity to do that. So... Um, I'd say that war is a complicated case involving conflicting interests. I would expect that it would not be at the forefront of moral development. Yet even there, um, we see these kinds of uh, changes historically. So is, is it the case that just talking about it makes things better? The fact that we discuss these things a lot more probably than we used to. I, you know, I remember 40, 50 years ago, I think the world was a lot more racist than it is now. and I wonder whether 
changing attitudes. I mean, some people would say, well, you know, the world is still incredibly racist. And I'd say, sure, but it's a question of degree. And, and, and to me, it seems like we've moved in the right direction, even from personal experience. But is it the case that just talking about it and discussing it makes us appreciate the other side? It's almost like I think of morality as sort of a multi-factor model where let's say let's say racism is innate because we care for community and so we care for people like us. So maybe it's innate, but maybe empathy is innate as well. And that's learned. So there's there's something innate in us, but there's there's also some sort of learned behavior. So is it the case that just by talking about it and discussing it, we actually become better moral creatures, for lack of a better phrase? Well, I do think that being open about various questions and having dialogue and sharing information and experiences does matter. I think the psychologist will tell us that uh, most important for changing attitudes, racist attitudes, for example, or gendered attitudes, is actually having relations with people of other groups in which one uh, collaborates in some way, uh, depends upon the other in some way, contributes to the activity of oneself. So it doesn't just talk about things, but actually is together with the individual in some kind of a shared project. And that seems to have an effect not only on people's explicit racist views, but even on their implicit uh, racist attitudes. And so you could think talking alone is probably not enough to rely upon, but it, talking is, if you like, it's a kind of interaction. And insofar as we're actually talking with each other, we're listening to what the other says and responding to it. And that is already imputing to the other a certain kind of standing. And so you could think that the capacity to have these conversations as meaningful conversations is exactly an example of this kind of collaborative activity, because conversations are collaborative activities and they're perspective-taking activities. So we shift into the perspective of the other in conversation, be, to some extent see ourselves from, from their perspective or see things from their perspective. Our empathic abilities enable us to do this. Our theory of mind abilities enable to do it. Our causal capacities enable us to do it. And so I would say that's a good example of how we use uh, competencies that are common across causation, theory of mind, social learning, moral learning, we use these capacities to engage in activities, collaborative activities, know how to do that, know how to do it successfully or unsuccessfully. And so talking about it, I think, does have effects if we're really talking with each other. Unfortunately, a lot of what looks like talking with each other isn't because people aren't really listening to one another and they're not trying to take the perspective of the other. Yeah, good point. Talking versus posturing, I guess, because there can be a lot of talking, but it isn't real talking. It's just posturing. When I was reading about the trolley problem and variants of it, I couldn't but help ask myself whether the switch problem is equivalent to a drone operator sitting in Las Vegas and operating a machine in some remote part of the world without that immediacy or the, the contact or, or the empathy. Is there a danger that that's what happens with AI and machines? Uh, we just get machines to do more and more of their dirty work for us, for lack of a better word. I mean, war is dirty work, but there's but just in sort of everyday life, we, we want machines to kind of do a lot more of the stuff for us. And you know, this almost is getting into sort of an Isaac Asimov kind of a world. But is that potential danger with, with AI at the moment, that it might make us lose that empathy that we might otherwise have? Yeah, that's a very good point. And it does seem to be fairly well documented that there are certain situations that augment people's empathic responses and certain situations that uh, discourage em empathic responses. And one situation that does discourage empathic responses is uh, inserting uh, psychic and physical distance between individuals, uh, removing any kind of person-to-person -person feedback between the individuals, uh, having an inst a merely instrumental action to perform with respect to individuals, as opposed to, for example, a conversation. And so I think you're quite right. These technical means are going to enable us, already, already do enable us, to carry out acts of violence and warfare in ways that are unlikely to be the most effective at inducing empathy. 
and most likely to be effective in purely instrumental reasoning. So you could think that we should be highly mindful that it's not the same if we are able to, and this has been true with the bombing of civilians and warfare and so on, it, it is not the same if people can carry out these actions in a situation where they aren't using their competency as empathic individuals, where they don't see that. And so, uh, yes, I, I think uh, you identified a, a feature of modern warfare, and it began before now, it began with strategic bombing, so-called, and even before that, various forms of long-distance bombardment, that it becomes possible to inflict tremendous harm on people, innocent people, without having the experience of seeing the suffering when it's actually producing. Indeed. And in fact, this sort of long-distance bombardment reminds me of a conversation I had with Molly Crockett just a few weeks ago about social media as well, that being removed from the individual is very different from having a face-to-face -face interaction. That is, we would be averse to saying a lot of things face-to-face to someone that we might not be on social media where we just say something, it goes into the ether, we express disgust or rage or whatever, mm -hmm. and then we go get a beer yeah. and see what happens. And so, you know, I'm sort of drawing an analogy, maybe it's a little far-fetched between, you know, the social media bombardment and the actual mm -hmm. bombardment that happens in war, <laughs> you know, bombardment at a distance. You know, I wonder whether the two are actually not that uncorrelated. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad analogy. Uh, We've probably all had the experience uh, in some, uh, say, unit that we work with, like a department or a, um, a workplace, at how things can go off the rails if uh, correspondence is all carried out by email rather than face-to-face -face relations, because you're not getting feedback from the way others are responding to what you're saying. And it's quite possible for people to get quite indignant, to become a bit more cruel than they expect to be normally. And uh, social media it can enhance this still further because the individuals you're harming may not even be known to you. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think if we, if we imagine that moral competency is a skill, we should be aware that we're creating situations in which that skill is not being well-developed and well-deployed. So one question would be, how could we redesign something like email or something like social media to reduce that. And so I would be interested to see how things have differed, for example, where so many of our uh, uh, interactions that might have been done by email are now being done by a video. Um, if you've got a group of individuals trying to make a decision and you have them doing it on email or if you have them doing it on Zoom, uh, do you get differences in, in outcomes, differences in degrees of cooperation, collaboration, and concern? Um, obviously, Zoom is not in person but it gives you much more information about the individuals you're interacting with. And so uh, in a similar way, how could we think about warfare? Should there be types of weaponry that we just restrict because they uh, so heavily favor this kind of non-empathic response? And so um, my hope coming out of World War II, for example, is that uh, we, we won't accept a policy in the future of large-scale bombing of civilian populations in order to lessen the enemy's morale, as it was put, that we, we now are aware of what that actually amounts to on the ground. Um, so there may be forms of, of, of warfare, just as we banned gas warfare, we banned bayonets with, uh, with round cross sections in order to uh, recognize that there are types of weaponry that if you put them in people's hands, uh, they will create injuries and wounds and harms that go beyond what we think would be appropriate. So I'm going to ask you to put on your speculative hat here for a bit. AI is, I guess the train has left the station. We have machines, the increase in intelligence is palpable, it just in their ability to perceive the world, in their ability to make judgments in various areas of our life. And at the same time, we're trying to and we're becoming aware of their harms and side effects because one of the things about technology is it always sort of runs away from you in ways that you don't expect. And so there's a lot of interest now in, I guess, developing capabilities or putting constraints on these systems or having them have certain sort of guarantees 
you know, that they're not going to engage in ways that could be really harmful. Where do you stand on this? How do you look at this? Are you optimistic that we'll be able to do this in time? Or do you think this thing, this problem is just sort of going to run away from us and we'll just deal with it in a catch as catch can manner, to use a wrestling expression? Well, yeah, I wish I had a good answer. Uh, well, that's why I said I'm asking you to put on your speculative hat. Yeah. Yeah. And beware if you ask philosophers to speculate. <laughs> There's a story about a very well-known uh, historian who was uh, taking his uh, A-levels exam back in the day, uh, in, this was in a colonial setting, and was asked in a question that was supposed to be about Plato, what's the difference between a philosopher and a ruler? And uh, said, well, a ruler is 12 inches long, but a philosopher will go to any length. <laughs> so what would I speculate? One thing I'm sure will happen is there will be lots of systems that that run away and that don't do exactly what we wanted them to do. Uh, the incentives aren't right. The We don't really know how to specify the objective functions in such a way as to uh, make these systems uh, reliable, uh, trustworthy. Uh, we also don't, you know, we can't even say, well, that maybe they should learn our preferences because uh, um, we don't know our own preferences uh, entirely. And besides, we may not want them to learn our preferences. And we know right. that acting on our preferences leads to all kinds of problems. Right. We talk about running away, right? Uh, yeah, humans are, they're, you know, we're intelligent machines that constantly run away and produce unintended consequences that are, that are dire. So it's not as if introducing machines would change that fact. So we'd have machines blundering on in parallel to us blundering on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we've developed all kinds of ways of trying to deal with this, and, and they don't take us to the point of having a, a you know, a, a, an ethical ma matrix that we can specify. I think they do involve the development and the gain of knowledge and competency. And so uh, I, the way I think about this, and this is perhaps silly for someone who's really a professional, there are going to be bad actors, human actors, uh, who are going to use AI. Uh, and they're going to be able to use it effectively because it's becoming an increasingly powerful tool. So what we have to be thinking about is not just machine agents, but humans with machine agents, especially in the short run. And so we need to be thinking, question, what would be a kind of a, uh, artificial intelligence that would enable us to do a better job of uh, achieving the kinds of goals we think are most important? And probably as the machines become more agential and more sophisticated, more knowledge, that means we're going to have to treat them as well as we hope they will treat us. And so if you think that computers will learn from their environment, uh, if we have an environment in which a child is treated uh, uh, disrespectfully, instrumentally, violently, poorly, uh, unfairly, they will learn a lot of antisocial behaviors. So if we're trying to develop the, the, the linguistic capacity of machines, we'll talk to them. If we're trying, we'll have them engaged in conversation with us. And if we're trying to develop the social understanding of machines, we should have a society with them and ask the question, how can we have a joint society with machines, which does a better job of realizing joint goals than we could achieve on our own? or than we would get if we didn't involve the machines in this kind of a shared effort. Interesting notion that as machines get smarter, we would do well to treat them with care so they learn the right things and help us create a better society of humans and intelligent machines. Can't treat them carelessly, same as our fellow humans. So before we wrap up, I often ask my Guests, what advice they have for young people these days? So you teach undergraduates. You know, I usually advise people to, these days, you know, study philosophy and, and study computing for different reasons. What do you advise people to do to, to educate themselves and position themselves well for the future? Ah, well, in recent decades have been decades of tremendous change in uh, the kinds of occupations, for example, that... Uh, are available to create employment. And it's going to get, the change may accelerate with the development of AI because so many jobs which have required human activity may require less of it. So any, any advice would have to be that uh, work on your general intelligence, 
that, that will probably involve taking some philosophy, will probably involve taking some computer science because this is the environment that we're inhabiting, taking some psychology, and recognizing that what we'll need is adaptiveness rather than a specific set of skills. I, someone once told me that the, the top 10 occupations in terms of uh, job availability over the course of uh, several decades tends to be uh, replaced almost completely. And so uh, there isn't really a, 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 a strong recommendation that one can make on that basis. On the other hand, if you think that it's possible for us to be adaptive and flexible, but we will need general purpose capacities for that, and we'll need general purpose capacities to be better individuals as colleagues and in our ethical relations and political relations with one another. So I would emphasize uh, that idea. And the great thing about that idea from this standpoint is that it's tremendously exciting to learn all this stuff. It may not be so exciting to sit down and try to master a very particular curriculum, but if one recognizes that even that particular curriculum may not be what you need 10 years from now in order to be adaptive in the market for employment, then uh, you can think to yourself, I actually should pursue things that I find intrinsically interesting uh, and, and make room for that at any rate. And so one thing you could also think, I believe, is that There'll be areas that are much slower to be taken over by machines, and um, those might be uh, especially areas of involving high degree of uh, human interaction and care by their nature. Uh, and so one might think that that's a, a way to focus one's energies. But I, I, I guess I think we tend to think of careers and education very instrumentally. Career is how you're going to spend your life. Your education is how you're going to as people say, furnish the room in which your mind is going to spend the rest of its existence. And to the extent that we do that in a purely instrumental fashion with regard to short-term goals, we may find that it doesn't lead to a satisfying existence. And I would hope that one thing that AI does for us is to enable us to make more interesting occupations available for people that draw upon, going back to my example of the, in my experience in the factory, that actually draw upon the richness of human capacities. And in fact, use that resource effectively and allow it to evolve and develop. Well said, good stuff. I guess the, the one final question is, what, what advice do you have for people who want to get into this area of morality and what you call moral learning? We will have show notes and I'll point to your article on moral learning, which I found to be a real storehouse of research summarized. So it was a great way to get caught up on this area. Are there other sources other than show notes? How would you encourage people to get into this area that's sort of at the intersection of intuitions about morality, machines? What's a good way to get jump started in this arena? Hmm, I'll have to think about that. One, uh, one thing that I think people can do is subscribe to a journal that covers an area that isn't one specialization. So I've found over time that subscribing to psychology and neuroscience and cognitive science journals was extremely valuable because I would read something in an entirely different context and the importance of it for thinking about the philosophical questions I had would, would, would be able to strike me. So I would urge people to, to read journals and books in areas other than their own and to allow the idea of, so, so there's an idea of interdisciplinarity around, which is there are these things called interdisciplines and uh, you have to become something like a Renaissance man in order to be in the interdiscipline. There's another picture in which you think, well, disciplines afford bodies of knowledge and ways of thinking. And what you want to do is to bring those together, but that doesn't mean creating a a third type of capacity. It's taking those capacities and using them, getting sufficiently versed in them that one can take advantage of what the different perspectives have to offer. And so I, I would uh, urge people to, uh, and this would be true on, on political matters too, read political publications that don't agree with you, listen to the news programs that don't agree with you, have Try to find ways in which you're in relationships, uh, formal or informal, with individuals who, who don't agree with you. 
and uh, and hope uh, that what will come out of this is not just sort of more tolerance and understanding and so on, but uh, the possibility of genuinely new ideas and uh, genuinely new ways of, of paths for, for, for going forward. Great advice. It reminds me of a quote by Marvin Minsky, one of those pioneers of AI, where he, you know, he says something to the effect that understanding really means that you can keep turning things around in your head, you know, forever. It's sort of the ability to sort of keep turning things. And, you know, I, I was struck by how much you referred to the literature on psychology in your article on, on the foundations of moral learning, you know, all of the literature around input learning. So uh, I see exactly where you're coming from. Well, Peter, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you so much for sharing your time and, and expertise uh, with the rest of the world. Very much appreciated. Well, thanks for your questions and, and your contributions and, and your ideas. Uh, and thanks for this effort on your part to provide a source of information of the kind that you're developing. I guess that's something that I would mention to people <laughs> on my list of things to to consult. It's not something we tend to get rewarded for in the typical academic hierarchy or anything like that, but it is something that's a real contribution. And uh, so I thank you for that. Thank you, Peter. I really enjoy it. It's a lot of work to read up all this stuff and, and talk to people who are so much deeper than you in their area. Tremendous learning exercise for me, but thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for telling me that. And Montaigne, who said, uh, the secret of uh, happiness throughout life is uh, to learn something new every day. Indeed. It, it's, it's, I, I, I heard you know, somewhere that uh, you know, Einstein's mother sort of asked him every day, so what did you learn today in school? Yeah. So that, that really resonates with me indeed. It's, it's all about lifelong learning. Well, thanks very much. Take care. Thank you.